That's a cool picture. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for being here today. It's really a pleasure for me uh, to introduce uh, my colleague, Eric Garrison, and he's visiting with his uh, postdoc, Andrea, who's back there. Um, Andre Eric has a, a very interesting history in, in science. Um, he actually started as an undergraduate at Harvard and where he did some social science work. He, was, uh, he worked on social structures and communication technology. Uh, way back when. And then he spent about eight years getting all kinds of interesting, varied experiences in the world of uh, nucleic acids and sequencing and bioinformatics. Um, and I think it was during this time that he created some different uh, methodologies for detecting DNA variants. And I think that's probably what spurred him um, to his interest in uh, genome variation uh, very broadly. And so in 2014, he started a PhD at Cambridge, and that's really where um, he uh, focused on this graphical pangenomics world that he's going to share with us today. Um, in 2020, he became an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee Health Sciences Center, and um, he is a uh, I would call him part of a new wave of leaders in thinking about how to, uh, to assemble and analyze and use different kinds of sequencing um, information, this explosion of information that's available to us now. And really um, his expertise is how to think beyond a single reference genome, which turns out to be kind of a limiting way to think about genomes. Um, He's got some really innovative approaches he's going to share with us. He's the co-chair of the Human Pan-Genome Reference Consortium. He works in many different kinds of genomes, not just human genomes. And he and I share uh, some interest in the dark matter of the human genome, which is how we ended up finding each other um, online. And uh, we've been very fortunate at the Stowers to host many of the leaders from the Telomere to Telomere Consortium. And, and um, Eric's work, I think, is very exciting and, and, and uh, made huge contributions in this area. So I'm excited to hear um, from you today. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the hospitality here at Sowers. It's been a wonderful morning, and we've we've met a ton of folks. And I just um, yeah, it's it's really nice to be at a place where everyone is on a kind of level playing field, and there's there's the ability to go after basic kinds of questions. And I guess in a way, that's why I'm here because of these common interests with Jen and, and others here about the way that that genomes develop and evolve at, at all scales. So. So I've got, um, I've got some material now for you today, and I'll, I'll get right into it. So the, the first thing I want to do is introduce some mathematical concepts that are a little unusual in, in biology and bioinformatics. Huh, I was trying to turn all these off, but uh, it's like I'm missing a phone call. Um, yeah, so, so this, is, this is a little bit unusual. I think it's not part of the standard bioinformatics canon or like biological kind of canon. And so I want to introduce it clearly. But basically, we work on, on a data structure that lets us compare many genome sequences to each other while encoding both the sequences themselves and all kinds of variation between them that are possible. And the, the mathematical model is called a variation graph. The key idea is that you have a sequence graph, so that's sequences on nodes with edges between them. This it makes a kind of language that is a set of possible things you can say, sequences you can write that are basically valid genomes in some context. And it's actually a sort of compressor for a set of genomes that are actually paths walking through the nodes and edges of the graph. And in this visualization, we've got the paths kind of drawn down below. Each one can be thought of as a sequence of tokens. So 83, 85, 87, they correspond to nodes, correspond to individual bits of DNA. And in fact, these bits of DNA, if you think about them, are effectively alleles. So it's a decomposition of many genomes, all the variation between them, into a set of alleles, and, and provides us this basic way of relating many complete genomes to each other. And that's, that's what we, we use it for. And I'll be showing the results on that. 
So there, this, this thing is, a, is an answer to a key problem in bioinformatics, which is this thing that I alluded to. We want to represent both the sequences and the variation between them. I think standard approaches are very common in the field right now, begin with a reference and think about the other sequences in terms of variance against that reference. We're, we're kind of flipping things around. In our context, every embedded genome, every one of those paths is like a reference itself. And so you, you can change your frame of reference and in fact, do genomics from many frames of reference simultaneously. And these are, these are pangenomic models in the sense that uh, you know, a pan genome represents all the genetic information in a collection of genomes, which maybe is from some clade, or maybe one species, a family, one organism. And, and so these are, are ways of linking all those things together, and they provide us a nice formalism to project them into a simple space. In this case, a matrix. Every genome can be seen as a binary vector in a matrix across the alleles of the graph. And that lets us use all kinds of standard downstream approaches that you can do if you can do statistics, you can do population genetics, um, they should generalize to this. And the benefit is that we get all kinds of variation in complete genomes in those models. Um, yes, that's what I said. And so another thing that is important about these, sequence, about these models is that they provide a human interface to very complicated sets of relationships. So they've been used, and in fact, um, the name is amazingly almost identical. Here's this variant graph. Uh, this is just a few years before I started my PhD. I wasn't aware of this until my roommate informed me of it because he was doing archival research. And he says, oh, your thesis, like, it looks a lot like this thing. He says, by the way, yeah, people made the same data structure. Here they have nodes and edges. The nodes and edges are switched around, but on the edges you have sequences. And in this case, it's a representation of the old all relationship of nine versions of a poem about the Italian countryside that shows you the conservation and the variation in the system. So conservation, we're always talking about an arc, so sorry, a bow of a violin that's measuring something, some silence, and then the, the poet is changing everything else, right? And we can see that instead of having to do all the pairwise comparis comparisons of these nine poems, we can see it in the structure of the graph. And that, that same thing, but scaled up to gigabases, is what we're working with. I mean, this is part of the reason we work with it. So uh, there's another preliminary, which I wanted just drive home, you know, why is this kind of stuff happening now? Surely in the beginning of bioinformatics, people thought of this, and they did. In the 1970s, they're like, hey, sequence graph, paths going through a sequence graph. That's a nice way to relate things, but we didn't have complete genomes. And so what's happened in the past few years is that we've been able to completely assemble genomes. I kind of want to em emphasize why that's the case, even though I think in this audience, we've many practitioners of this art. So perhaps this is old, old news to many of you. But the gist of genome assembly is that you know you have um, you have chromosomes from actual organisms. You know you have to fragment them to read them because you can't maintain them in, in complete state um, and, and read them directly. And and so that sequencing process results in little bits. And then in theory, you can find the bits that are similar to each other, overlap them, put them all back together, and get this kind of combined result, which is an assembly. It's a representation of all the genomes you have. And uh, biology just doesn't, doesn't help because biology is all about you know, copying things, duplicating genes and transposons moving around. And you know, genomes are basically just made up of repeats that have expanded and diverged. So when you try to do this game of, of finding all the bits that overlap and putting them together, the best you can do is something called a string graph. And in effect, if these arrows are different repeat classes, so the black ones are almost identical, and the gray ones are almost identical. In this graph, those get collapsed if the repeats are longer than your sequences that you're using for sequencing, and the, the error rate of your sequencing is above the divergence between the repeats, then this is the best you can do. And so what's happened very recently is that we can completely assemble genomes because now our sequence reads span those repeats, and their error rates are lower than the repeat differences. Um, and there's two mechanisms for this. Again, maybe not the best audience to go in detail in, in this because I'm sure you understand it, but you have the zero mode uh, waveguide system behind PacBio Hi-Fi where there's a polymerase that you can observe because it's interacting with fluorescently labeled DNTPs that it's incorporating into a new strand of DNA. 
This gives you this kind of signal of fluorescence intensity when a given base is incorporated, aggregating this across the synthesis of lots and lots of molecules that you are circularized, so you can read them over and over. Gives you what's called uh, PacBio HiFi, Pacific Biosciences HiFi, which is this read that's incredibly accurate because you're reading everything over and over, and your errors are not very well correlated in the system. So eventually, you get the very, very high accuracy of a single read. Then the other thing that's helpful, so that gets you shorter pieces, maybe 15 to 20 kb long. They're very highly accurate. Uh, the other thing that's great is that now we can directly read single molecules of DNA transiting through an electrophoretic membrane. And, and we can effectively read off electrical current that corresponds to what bases are inside of a protein pore. And um, this gives us this very confusing signals, but these can be de deconvolved into actual sequences. And these can be very, very long megabases, perhaps. Um, we can get them reliably to 100 kb. And those two technologies in combination let us resolve the string graph for most organisms such that we can actually get an automated assembly of a diploid individual. So now this will make it easy to get whole genome assemblies. And it shifts a lot of the problems in bioinformatics more towards the question of interpretation. How do we understand the variation between many complete genome assemblies? So I'll jump over this a little quick, but Virco is the technique um, it's developed by Adam Philippi and, and, and group. Um, and it, it effectively, yeah, it allows you to make, as they show here, a complete diploid resolved assembly of a human genome where um, all, the, all the chromosomes are basically individual components in this, this graph. They've been labeled by their maternal and paternal state. And there are a few places where they can't resolve because they're homozygous, but they can be scaffolded out into individual contexts. Okay, so that's the background. And uh, where, where I enter into this, as Jen was describing, is in the context of comparing these assemblies to each other to understand the variation within them. And so that, that is a pangenomic problem. And there's a project called the Human Pangenome Project, which is sponsored by the NIH and HGRI. And its goal is to assemble around 350 complete human genomes to the quality of the Telomere to Telomere assembly that was recently released. Um, and it, you know, it's in process. We've just done our first major, major kind of release. Uh, it's called the draft of this, um, this pan genome. And I'll be talking about that here. We have 44 individuals. Uh, there's a few individuals as well that have been held out for validation purposes, but in effect, you have 90 haplotypes because there's 44 individuals and two references. Um, papers on this are in press. They will be coming out in, in early May. And um, some of these results will be in them. In effect, you know, the, the assembly question, let's say we've solved that. I'll show you what we do downstream. We build uh, variation graph type models, three of them. There are graphs in which you have nodes as alleles and, and the genomes are walks through the graph. There's three methods. The, the one I'll talk about is the one I developed called PGGB, the pan genome graph builder. But there are other, these two other methods that are uh, orthogonal in approach and um, we cross-validate off each other. One is called Minigraph by Han Lee, who's the uh, author of many, many bioinformatics tools you probably use every day. And there's Minigraph Cactus, which combines, um, this is actually just a, uh, it is a structural variant perspective. It doesn't have a base level variation like SNPs and combination with the Cactus multiple whole genome aligner from Benedict Patton's group, they're able to put the, the small variants onto the graph and um, they achieve the same kind of result that we do with this, this graph uh, genome builder. So, right, so the, this is in press and uh, it will be coming out soon, a complete version of this paper called a draft pan genome, human pan genome reference. So uh, yeah, I'll talk a bit about the, the process of actually building the graph. So the, the gist of it is that um, you, can, you can see that the graph that I showed you, it represents all these pairwise relationships. So you, could, you can imagine extracting those out of the graph, but then to create it, you have to, you have to learn the pairwise relationships. So we start by doing really expensive, but useful pairwise alignment. So imagine there's two sequences here, and this describes the bases that match between them. We do these pairwise alignments for hundreds of genomes, perhaps, and that gives us a set of alignments. Then the combination of those alignments and the sequences makes this thing called an alignment graph, which we then convert into 
the variation graph. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then finally, uh, that graph actually is very disordered in some ways locally, and so we, we smooth it and normalize it in a downstream process, actually a series of downstream processes that make it easier to work with, to visualize, have a more parsimonious explanation for the sequences that might be what comes directly out of the graph induction step. So, right, I said this through this tool called uh, WFMASH. WFMASH stands for Wavefront Mash Map. Um, and in fact, it's the combination of the two fastest techniques for sequence homology and alignment you could find. Uh, wavefront algorithm is a, a sequence alignment algorithm that it basically, sh it, let's say it's a synthesis of many ideas that have been in bioinformatics for a while, but it shows that instead of filling out this full matrix to do alignment as you usually do, so here every, every cell in the matrix is telling you a score of an alignment, the best score of an alignment between the two sequences that reaches that place. So instead of filling this whole thing out, if you're just interested in alignment that goes end to end, you can in fact only fill out these and get exactly the same result. What you can do is by progressively expand this wavefront of cells that have a certain score until you get to the last cell in the matrix. At that point, you, you don't need to go anywhere else. You, you know the answer. Right? And so th this has been demonstrated nicely by, uh, by Santiago Marco Sola, who is the author of this method. And then we, we took this idea and expanded it so that we actually work on not single bases, but we work on 256 base pair segments, segments that are longer. And the matching is approximate. And that lets us align multi mega base pair sequences. This is a multiple mega base pair sequence from E. coli against another one, and uh, with very large structural variance. This gray region is a part where we're exploring, but not matching. So we see that there's a big indel here, for example. And then actually, we, we use a, another variant of this method that works in very low memory. It's called bidirectional WFA. And in effect, it, you search without remembering anything. You search until two ends meet. And when those two ends meet, you recurse into that over and over. And you can see the pattern. Um, and it does this without having to remember anything except these points that you see along the diagonal. And so that lets us then scale this to be you know, very large sequence alignment problems. And so the, the graph induction is actually very intuitive. Um, it's very hard to implement, but intuitively what you have are a set of these texts, which are genomes. And if, if you think that these dotted lines represent matches asserted by my aligner, then when I want to make the graph, I have to condense all the nodes that are connected by the dotted lines. So these get condensed into one node in the output graph, and so on. Imagine going through every one of these, progressively adding new nodes, and then at the end, we trace the original paths through the graph, and that makes a variation graph. So we, we can do this for the whole, whole genome. We work in whole chromosomes, typically. Um, and then finally, there's this normalization process. We actually learn a one-dimensional embedding that minimizes the divergence between the distances of the nodes and the distances in the paths. And that's being animated here at the top. So it converges to something more stable. And then we can subject pieces of this to local multiple sequence alignments. That's the normalization process. So yeah, as I said, there's other methods to build the, the graphs, and we, we basically use them for cross-validation. Because they're very different fundamental bases. Um, Minigraph is a fully progressive approach. It starts with a reference, and you add more variation from each genome onto it, aligning to the graph every time to reduce redundancy. And then if you take that graph and you then put the genomes back on it, you can find the small variants. And, and so the result here is actually identical in format to what we got from this with the PGGB pipeline. And so the cross-validation, uh, we, we use variant calls from samples that were made with the original HIFI reads against the reference. We, we compare those to variants extracted from the, the bubble structure of the graph. Um, it's something, unfortunately, I think I skipped over. But in effect, if you imagine um, you have one entry node, and one exit node from a region and differences in the middle, that's like a definition of a variant. And so we find those, convert them into SNPs or indels, and compare them with the truth set. And in effect, our precision and recall very similar between the methods. The, the red is the minigraph cactus, blue is PGGB, and they, they, they suffer similarly in harder regions like segmental duplications, tandem repeats, and so on. Um, but, but for regions that are easy, we do extremely well. Um, or, or just as good as if you did standard variant calling. And this is also true for structural variants. So in the same you know, one fell swoop with those whole assemblies, we're able to see both the small variants 
and and the small and the structural variance. And um, here you see the same kind of uh, distributions across the samples, same kind of pattern. Easy variants tend to be like indels with transposons and this kind of thing. Um, and this shows the distribution across the length frequency spectrum and the validation rates at the top for both methods. Basically, we don't suffer much more when you get to longer or shorter events. So it, it, so it shows that we're able to work at all scales. So uh, now, now I want to give some vignettes and you know, get, using these nice visualizations we can make, let's look at what kinds of things come out. What can we see? So, so first off, uh, we have a toolkit that's designed to work downstream of these constructed graphs to actually make sense of them. And these are some points of things you could do with it. It's, this is published in, actually it's the bioarchive has actually been published in bioinformatics in the last year. It's called Oggi, which is a bad Italian joke about things being possible today. Because uh, for many years I heard the refrain that tomorrow we're gonna use graph genomes and the goal was to make it possible today. So it's the optimized dynamic graph something. Um, but what you can do is you can do a, a layout of the graph in two dimensions. This is showing an animation kind of similar to one before. Um, and it shows you these bubble structures that you can interpret by zooming in and looking at the different paths that go through them. This is the same kind of layout, but for the whole human MHC. And this, this square here is the region we're looking at in the bottom. Here we, we, we cut this out and visualize it in another tool called Bandage with some annotations layered on top of it. Uh, we can zoom in and look at the specific uh, nucleotide differences that differentiate two copies of the gene C4, C4A and C4B, they have a different function, and this corresponds to this little region right here. But we can also make these one-dimensional visualizations where um, we kind of made a, a binary, it's not really a binary matrix, it's a matrix above the graph. So th this is this loop, you can see the loop structure here, you can see the indel, here, that's a human endogenous retrovirus. Um, and this shows you like where, where are the genomes? Oh, they all have this copy, except one doesn't have any copies of that. There's the orientation of them that's arbitrary because they're from assemblies, the orientation is random. And this is one that's very interesting. It shows you the copy number variation. So where it's gray, it's one fold coverage. And where it's red, it's two. And where it's orange, it's three. So it shows you basically immediately that one, one of these has three loops through this thing. Um, and that will correspond to, if we take the alignments out of the graph using what we call untangling, then we can see it here. And we can actually see that there, it would probably correspond to two copies of C4B and one copy of C4A, right? Whereas this one has no copy of C4A, just C4B and so on. So this is like a toolkit for zooming in, looking at these graphs, um, and it gets a question. It's kind of like the ones being answered here. This is all done quite manually. These are visualizations of the, um, RH locus, where, which is, defines RH blood group system. And this is in one graph, mini graph cactus. Basically, you know, you have different copies of the RHD gene. This, you can have one or two. Um, and then there's different haplotype descriptions here. And this is the same thing in the human HLA. These are pseudogene copies of HLA-A. Um, and uh, an interesting point is that, this is, from, so this is from the other graph, just to show you that they're both useful. Um, this region here around what's called HLA-Y, that's uh, an ancestral state that's deleted in the standard GRC reference. It's one of the biggest kind of novel sequences that we add back in to the pan genome. And so we can also look at the whole chromosome. So we can zoom out and do these two-dimensional visualizations, but for not just little regions, but really the whole thing. And just to give you a feeling for what those are like, I've got a few chromosomes here. So the first one is chromosome one. And uh, the, this crazy knot in the middle is the centromere. And in effect, you can see there's a loop structure that would correspond to the high order repeat. So genomes go into that, they loop around hundreds of times, and then they go out. And the fact it gets so big and crazy is sort of an artifact of our visualization system. Um, another, other, maybe also diversity perhaps in the centromere, this is chromosome eight. So here's the centromere, here's what's this 8P. I'll zoom in on this in a second. Eight. Q. This is an acrocentric. The last part of the talk gets into those. And this is uh, chromosome 20, which is kind of interesting because near the centromere, it's got a lot of variation. So anyway, you can see these things at a high level. It gives you the ability to look at the mutual alignment of 90 haplotypes in one fell swoop. So zooming in on this beta defense in locus, this is a nice uh, kind of vignette of, of 
patterns that we see frequently thanks to this whole genome assemblies. So here you have a five megabase pair inversion here, which is this loop. And if you look at the two reference genomes, so CHM13 is the um, T to T assembly. This is the GRC assembly from human. They actually have an inversion relative to each other. And um, these repetitive bits at the edges are why the inversion exists and why it's polymorphic in the population. Because non-allelic homologous recombination between these repetitive cassettes, which correspond to loops here, allow this to flip back and forth at a very high rate. In fact, there's a paper recently from, from some co-authors on the HPRC paper that showed it's happening something like one in every 10,000 births that you, you get an inversion. So it's, it's extremely frequent. And um, it's also interesting because uh, perhaps because of the existence of this inversion, perhaps because of selective pressure, the rate of this is SNP density across chromosome for the two references. So from the same graph, we pull out two sets of variants. They, they correspond to each other. You can see that it, it doubles in this whole region in the p-arm around the inversion. And that, that could be because of suppression of recombination due to the presence of the inversion. Right? And then uh, we have a technique to annotate the graphs. This is called uh, Geophestus. We can look at the two-dimensional visualization. And this lets us look at, at like where genes and other features map onto the graph. So zooming into this, we can see, um, well, I'll zoom in a little further because you kind of saw this already. But if we zoom into the knot at the base of this, where I talked about these repetitive sequences, there are these cassettes that include defensin genes. So there's a called the beta defensin locus. And the defensins are, in effect, uh, antibiotic type genes that are expressed by the innate immune system in epithelial cells. And um, so it makes sense that there would be under diversifying selection. And it's interesting that they are hanging out next to this big inversion, that they somehow, and it's, let's say it's all a bit chicken or egg, but it's like they're perpetuating the persistence of the inversion as well. One thing that's really interesting to me is that we can, because of these kinds of graphs, we can see, you know, they, they can focus us on certain things that might be a little unobvious if we look at individual assemblies. One of them is this gene FAM90A. Uh, it has huge polymorphism between different haplotypes, and we, we have no idea what it does. So it, it's an open question, um, but it's, it's kind of at the base of the loop. I mentioned the MHC before. Here we'll zoom back in on it. I'll show you another aspect of, of C4 again. So uh, this is on chromosome 6. You can imagine zooming in, zoom in again. The MHC class 2 genes, which are highly diverged, basically you have ILS back to human chimp gorilla and beyond. Um, they, they make this big bubble structure. If we zoom in on C4, um, a and B, there's actually a point I wanted to make on the next slide, I believe, that, well, first off, you get one ancestral copy in the graph. This, this PGGB graph will tend to collapse the VNTRs, which will make them easier to analyze later. Um, but the other thing it lets us do is look at gene conversion. So we see that there's nonlinear evolution in this locus. And what I mean by nonlinear is that if you have copy A and copy B, you don't always just get a, 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 B, 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 you might get B, A, or B, 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 A, right? You can go both ways. And for that to be happening, you have some kind of nonlinear evolutionary effect occurring. And uh, one of the companion papers actually gets into detail, in fact, about C4. They, they actually have an example of it. But they show that there's very, very high rates of gene conversion between homologous gene copies in these kind of families. So here we've extracted alignments to the canonical reference C4A and C4B. A is red and B is green. And you can see some of the patterns I'm talking about where mostly you have AB, but sometimes you have BA. And for that to happen, either you have a homoplasic state, an expansion, a contraction, or you have gene conversion happening. And I think that if we focus on a few of these cases because there's a lot, but we want to understand them well. I think that Probably this is a very common phenomenon in VNTR, so variable number of tandem repeat gene families, and it may be a dominant feature of their evolution even. Okay, so the last, last part of the talk gets into the collaboration I've had with Jen and others, where we, uh, we tried to look at the part of the genome which we'd never really understood systematically at population scale before. So as you, Many of you probably know, we've, com we've completed a T to T, telomere to telomere assembly of the human genome using a haploid human cell line. And this 
allowed us to see a bunch of regions that were missing from the reference and were only maybe present in fragmentary assemblies um, in, in existing literature. So those are shown on, on this carry type, they're shown in black. And um, in particular interest are, so most of them are centromeric, right? These are all centromeres, but five of them are on the short arms of the acrocentrics where the, we had not been able to get a complete assembly before. And so um, this, uh, this region, so if you make the, the kind of string assembly graph I was talking about in this assembly project, all the chromosomes became single components except for the acrocentrics and um, I think in this case, we didn't have an, a Y chromosome that perhaps would have been linked up with the X as well. Um, so it's actually this structure that we're interested in. Where is this coming from? Why is it established? And is this representative of just one cell line? Is it, you know, is it something that's been maintained by ongoing exchanges between these different chromosomes? That's the kind of working hypothesis. So I got, I got more interested in this because of some research we did in, in the assembly evaluation in the Human Pan Genome Project. So Hong Li had um, identified that if you use the T to T assembly as reference and you've mapped all of the assembled contigs we had against that, there's some contigs that would map optimally to more than one chromosome. So large segments of them would map to two different chromosomes. And with the exception of a few cases, I think there's this only one or two haplotypes that had very strange recombinations that were implied. All of these were involving the acrocentrics. And so I took, I took his uh, alignment data and converted it into what we call um, an, a mapping graph, let's say. So every node here, it's not, it's not like the variation graph. Right? Every node is a, is a contig or chromosome. And every edge is representing a case when there's a mapping between, between them. So what you get is this characteristic pattern where the acrocentric T to T chromosomes um, are you know, connected by multiple, the, the, the contigs we have, they're mapping to multiple ones. And these are the, these are the ones we're looking at here. So uh, we did this for all the contigs uh, in the entire set to see if there's any bias. So we just mapped them all to all the other ones, um, including the T to T reference chromosomes. And we basically see that every single, um, so this is the same kind of visualization, just done with all the 30,000 contigs or so. Um, and yeah, we see that there's this same kind of pattern, but in this, this structure, now it's in the pan genome, not in the single genome. And uh, we also see X and Y are quite close together. So this is suggestive, but the layout is actually heuristic and it, it's not something we wanted to base quantitative results on. So um, oh, I'll get into it. This, this just zooms in, it basically shows that the Q arm contigs, we, we, we check these are contigs that map to the Q arm, they're all kind of isolated on these five chromosomes. But there's this mess of, of contigs that are all really similar to each other, but from different chromosomes, where they're kind of most similar to one chromosome, we've colored them by, but they're all really similar to each other, and that results in this, this muddle. Um, and so we did, uh, yeah, so we made this quantifiable by doing community detection. Um, unfortunately, I'm not showing the, the labeling of it, but it's in our paper. In effect, you, if you make, you take this graph and you subdivide it so that the sets, the subsets of contigs you've got that are more similar to each other, they form modular components, um, and you maximize a metric for modularity, then you get communities. And this is usually applied to social network research um, and in these kind of uh, communicative exchange contexts. Here, we're thinking about communication as the homogenization of recombination, right? And so it actually is a very natural analog. So we apply these community detection techniques, and this is showing the community assignment and the chromosome that we've approximately inferred by mapping to the T to T reference. And we see that every chromosome is basically one community or two, and it's usually two because the centromere breaks the assemblies, um, except X and Y, which are held together by the pseudo autosomal regions and the acrocentrics. We have many, many contigs in one, in one community that appear to descend from different chromosomes. And oh, there, yeah, right. So we get the, the visualization of this is here and it's, it's kind of clear. You have this one mega community, which includes the model EMS. There's this one community for, um, uh, it's kind of a mix of X and Y. 
that's, that's a whole story on itself, which we don't get to into in the paper, but I won't have time to get to here. Uh, but we decided to make a graph focusing on the acrocentrics to then get a condensed view of what's going on. And to do this, we take the assemblies, we find a set of contigs that overlap the centromeres, because our evidence is all suggesting that, that beyond the centromere, in the long arms, you, you would have more unique sequences. So perhaps if we have contigs that go from that side into the short arm, we'll be able to give them a confident chromosome assignment. So this is basically from that chromosome. So we got contigs that were at least a megabase pair past the, cent the centromere on both sides. And uh, this is a subset, right? But it's still, it's still many. And we got um, we have some validation contigs from another sample. It's not a pangenome. And then we do this pangenome graph building I told you guys about, but with, with all of these contigs. And we get a very suggestive structure that shows us that basically the Q arms are unique as you then in the satellite sequences of the centromeres between 21 and 13 and 14 and 22, um, they're, they're so similar they start to collapse and come together. Basically, at the level of at the level of uh, alignment uh, similarity that we're using, they, they came together. And then in this region, which is zoomed into up here, um, you, you kind of have one entity that's a mix of different chromosomes with repetitive sequences. And in some cases, there's regions like this one around an array, uh, a repeat array called SST1. That is basically one-to-one -one copy on multiple chromosomes and not, not repetitive sequence. It actually has a genic with long on non-coding RNAs in it. And this to show you for context, these are the RDNA arrays from, <clears throat> from the reference. They actually were very repetitive in our graphs, they become collapsed into a knot. Um, and we, we really can't talk about them very much because our assemblies don't traverse them. Only the, only the reference assembly can traverse them because of its uh, better data quality, the fact that it's, it's homozygous and the manual validation went into it. So, so this is really suggestive, right? But you might say, well, you know, perhaps you guys just got this not to appear because you were really permissive with your alignment. There's some ancestral acrocentric, and then that, because you're saying, I'll, I'll let things align if they're up to 5% diversion, that's putting them all together. And so what we decided to do was to actually measure recombination patterns between the different contexts and relative to the reference chromosomes we have. And so we untangle recombination from this graph. So the, the idea of untangling is basically that the graph is a really sensitive alignment set, and we're going to extract pairwise alignments back out of that. And so we take a graph through which you have different paths. And we might take, uh, let's call it a query, so using the context of genome alignment, you know, with the query versus a target. So our targets are our references. And we're gonna ask, how do you reconstruct the query out of those targets in a way that you're maximizing the similarity at every, at every region across, across the query? And we, so basically we, we have to do this in pieces. So we cut the graph, we have a segmentation algorithm that makes little regions that we work on. And then within each one of these segments, we're able to find overlapping paths, overlapping sequences, and establish a similarity metric. We tend to use Jacquard, uh, which is basically the, the intersection over the union. So in, in, we'll do it in the, the sequence space. So how many bases do you have in common over how many bases are there in total between the two, the two uh, target and query. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, we do this. And so in this case, for example, you can see that if our query is the black contig, it's most similar to target one. And it has Jacquard of one. It's exactly the same path through the graph. But then uh, things get a little more complicated because we have to put these in a frame of reference for our own understanding. And so what we then do is we, we can say, well, that contig, we think it comes from 14 because of its Q arm assignment. And let's just act like it's there and tell me where on 14 it should occur, even if it best matches another, another chromosome. And so we call this grounding. And this then allows us to actually make visualizations that, and, and, and metrics relative to specific chromosomes. And they look like this. Um, so uh, breaking this down, we have a region of chromosome 13, which has a centromere in it. That's what we're zoomed in on here. These labels that give you the kind of architecture of the of the, the, the plot 
the rDNA is here, the repetitive sequences. I mentioned that none of our contigs really cross that. A few do, but we don't really trust them. We think the assemblies are probably incorrect. Um, the end, ends of the acrocentrics appear to have these big satellite sequences on them. Again, we can't reach into those, but that's an interesting story you want to pursue in the future. Our assembly is better. And yeah, then you have this region I mentioned before around the SST1 array, which I'll point out in a second, the centromere and the QR. The centromere, centromeres are, are diverging very rapidly. And so actually when we do this untangling operation and filter for, for sequences of enough similarity, we, we don't make a lot of uh, matches. So you get this kind of gap. And there's, there's some biological reasons for this, maybe a story for another time. Um, and there's some technical reasons too. Probably the assemblies aren't quite as good in the centromere. What you see is that the untangling, which is colored by which chromosome you're matching, for all the contigs that map to chromosome 13, as it makes sense, they all untangle to chromosome 13 in this context. Because in the graph, also there's no other chromosome to match. So that's how they are. But then you go through the centromere and then things start to get more complicated here. And I mentioned this SST1 array, it's a GC rich, array that has, um, it's not only GC rich, but we find it has lots of PRDM9 motifs in it. This is a PRDM9 density. The RDNA, by the way, has a lot, um, but also this one array. And, and it's in the middle of this region that's kind of um, variegated. Chromosome uh, contigs will go through there and we say they, they look like at least three different chromosomes. They look like 13, 21, and, and 14. And uh, so we can, we can count them. This gives you a kind of condensed representation of what you see above, looking at it from a different angle. And then we've established some different entropy metrics. But the key one is this thing called order entropy. And it's basically measuring what, what the, like the changes in a, a phylogenetic tree rooted your contig would look like. How would you reorder the similarity across all the chromosome, the reference chromosomes at every one of those positions? And that's then aggregated across all the contigs. Um, and this, this gives us a very, very sharp signal. We use this because it's, it's position specific. So we can, in, in theory, get a very precise boundary for where uh, recombination, recombining re region might, might be occurring. And you can see that there's a little bit before the centromere, and you have this region here, um, which we will call a pseudo homologous region because it behaves as if it's homologous to many other chromosomes that are not actually its homologs. And, and so, and that's, these are labeled up here. So we use this to then establish a set of bed intervals across the T to T chromosomes that are pseudo homologous and recombining in this way. And I won't spend a lot of time on these. If you wanna see them, they're in the paper we have, but just to show you that from these different frames of reference, you see a very similar pattern. So from the point of view of 14, um, this is where SST1 is, right? And you have the PHR is around it. And from 15, 15 has a lot of satellite sequences on it in the T to T assembly. And you kind of think it's a bit more diverged than these other acrocentrics. Doesn't, doesn't seem to interface with them as much until you get very close to the ribosomal DNA. So you can see here, this purple, pink, magenta rather, from chromosome 22. Um, 21, it's really like the analog of 13, just from a different point of view. And, and 22, um, again, a little bit less integrated than the other, the other four, or rather than, than um, 13, 14, and 21. So then, then finally, we, we ask about recombination from a population genetic perspective. So if we go into this regions, the PHRs, do we have signal that there's higher rates of recombination when we look at SNPs? We do this, and yes, there, there appears to be a higher rate of recombination or perhaps a higher effective population size because the uh, linkage disequilibrium, that's correlation between marker pairs inside of those PHRs, it decreases faster with distance than in the other parts of the short arms and also in the long arms, which are used as a kind of control. You can see that across the different chromosomes here for lengths that range um, from hundreds of base pairs, the bins are in hundreds of base pairs. This is a kilobase pair. So by about a kilobase pair out, you kind of clearly see that the linkage is higher on the Q arm in most cases, it's not true on 15 and 21, but anyway, you can see the pattern here. In fact, I think maybe this needs to be updated because of some updates to the, the uh, manuscript. But in any case, um, it is an independent validation of the same concept. 
And then uh, finally, we dig into uh, this SST1 linked PHR. Like what, what's going on there? It, it's on chromosomes that are typically involved in Robertsonian translocations. And this gave us a hint that there might be some involvement of these homolog homologous regions with recurrent Robertsonian translocation. So uh, first off, we couldn't really look at the SST1 array because it, as you see, there's these gap there. And so um, Leo in, in Jen's group established that the repeats within these different chromosomes were actually, uh, they're not monophyletic by chromosome. They, they form a kind of community in a phylogeny of the SST1 array units, whereas every other one and every other chromosome is chromosome specific. So it tells us the same patterns happening there, which is nice. But then, um, actually, I assume, yeah, I can zoom in on this. Um, and actually, there's another thing about um, the, the repeat units have a big deletion in them relative to what we see in other chromosomes. Yeah, this is a kind of uh, multiple entangling. It gives a perspective of the data that went into what we call the positional entropy information. And, and it, it's kind of looking across the tree at every position, saying that you know, this chromosome is most similar to you know, 13, then 21, then 14, for example. And it does it across all of them. The fact you see this kind of patchwork where you have multiple matches, that again is really indicative of a strong kind of recombination process. And then finally, this is the, the kind of the coolest outcome of the paper. And it's something, let's say it's a testable hypothesis because we, we don't have clear evidence from a Robertsonian cell line. This is exactly where the breakpoint occurs. But study, uh, study of back clones, which are shown here in green and red relative to uh, 14 and 21, they, um, so the green ones are found in the Robertsonian chromosome and the red ones are lost. And so they tried to find the breakpoint by mapping the back clones. Because this paper, they didn't have a good reference, they actually had a confusing outcome that we're not able to understand what we were seeing, partly because of the duplication of this region between the two chromosomes meant that these clones were actually basically identical to each other. Um, and so the, this is the region that we're talking about, this PHR. Um, and, and the implication of this is that uh, you know, so they have markers of other types they're able to confirm that these regions of the chromosomes are present and then all of these are gone. And so the implication is that this is actually where the crossover is occurring in Robertsonian cases. And it would make a lot of sense. You have a repeat enriched PRDM9 motifs in the middle of some homologous region. It would be a natural place to imagine this occurring. So with Jen, we're going to be trying to pursue this more, more directly with complete assemblies from Robertsonian carriers. This would be the, the schematic result. So uh, this is I think it's really fun that we're able to go after questions with population genetics and complete assemblies that have basically been floating around since people first saw any sequences from these chromosomes. So this is from uh, the paper that described the, the alpha satellites on, um, or the satellite sequences, yeah, alpha satellites on acrocentric chromosomes. They say, look, they're really similar to each other. Probably they're recombining. Like, how else could they maintain the similarity? It's 1988. Um, this, I'll jump over this, but in effect, the, the region, the distal region past the, the ribosomal DNA looks like it's all completely homogenizing across all the acrocentrics. Uh, this is really nice work. Um, and yeah, this, this is extremely suggestive, but it's sort of N of one. So in the, in the 1970s, there was work to look at the structure of the packetine nucle nucleus, understand how the chromosomes were relating to each other when they're in synapse. And, and so they're working from these kind of slices and electron micrographs like this. This group established uh, complete models of where most of the chromosomes in, in nuclei, nuclei and spermatocytes were. What I think is really cool is that 14P, 13P, and 21P are all attached to the same nucleolus at this stage. And so th this is like kind of physical distance theory that, that suggests that because these things are close together, they have the opportunity to recombine, and we see they're close together at exactly the point when there's meiotic recombination. Um, this, anyway, just to say, there's all kinds of stuff happening with recombination. Also, mitotic recombination. Uh, this is an example of the case of 15 and 22 that are recombining. Um, I'll jump past that. And you might say, well, we, we should have seen this before. But if you think about it, the numbers you need are just astronomical and really difficult. So this paper, literally titled Fishing, um, because they had to look through hundreds and hundreds of oocytes to see if they could find an association between 14 and 20 
uh, 21, which are the most important pair in Robertsonian uh, translocation because it's associated with uh, trisomy 21. Uh, they did, I think it was something like 300 cells uh, that they had to look at with fish, and they find one case where they think that, um, that 21 and 14 are close enough together that they might actually be in a synaptic state. But if you think, you know, having to do this at, with, to get a, a sufficient end would mean, you know, tens of thousands of cells and a huge amount of labor. We instead have gone after it with a population genetics angle that lets us look at the history of the whole human population. So I think that that provides a, an alternative explanation um, that at least to kind of synthesis of what is going on in these regions that were completely blank to our, to our science before. Um, well, not completely, excuse me, they're, they're blank to sequence-based genomics, and, which is important. For, for what we're doing. And in effect, there are these regions on the short arms of the acrocentrics, and they are somehow conserved. They might have important common function related to the nucleolar organization, and we'll call them pseudomologous regions. They physically can be in proximity because of their relationship with the nucleolus. And this can lead to recombination. The most common type of that will actually be gene conversion, which have a homogenizing effect. And we can't really distinguish from crossover type in the analysis we've done. All we can see is that there's homogenization and an exchange between different chromosomes. But we do know because of Robertsonian translocations that there is full on uh, crossover type of combination in these regions. And we have a hypothesis that it's exactly these kind of places that we'll see the recurrent breakpoint for Robertsonian translocations. And uh, I've basically described this. So without further ado, thanks to a ton of folks of course, Andrea, who's here, who can answer many questions about the work, and um, many folks on the HPRC and in the broader research community that's made the pan genome graph builder and techniques associated with it possible. So, thanks. We have a few minutes for questions. Hi. Um, I was wondering. <clears throat> because of how infrequent those loops seem to show up uh, in each of the chromosomes, could you somehow extract data from it to create some sort of fingerprint for like consanguineous populations or certain more homo uh, homogeneous populations? You're talking about the like <clears throat> loops on the pan genome graphs in general. Yes. Like, yeah, like using those the loops as structural variants. Yeah. Yeah. So probably, yeah, and it might, and usually the problem is that they're repetitive sequences, so it makes it hard. If you want to do a reduced representation marker type approach, that really frustrates you. Um, if, if you find sequences that are novel and big, that might make it very easy to do um, marker-based uh, genotyping and these kinds of estimates you're talking about. But yeah, I think that's the real trouble, that they're, they're often very, very similar to each other. Thank you. Hi, uh, I have a question on, on the loop regions. So uh, are those loop regions uh, variable between uh, different individuals or and yeah, between different uh, cell tissue type? Uh, different individuals is what we have. So for example, I think we're talking about the, this. This is an example? No, the loop region. Yeah, yeah, loop. This one? OK. Yes. Yeah, so this, this would be called um, VNTR type polymorphism. So there's a variable number of tandem repeats. They're, they're, they're tandem because they're head to tail, and they're repeats of some underlying sequence. And you can see, yeah, this, this gives you an overview of the haplotypes that we have. Um, the, the ancestral state in humans looks to be two copies. So there's A and B. But you have some with three. Um, and we know from other studies that there are ones with four or five. Um, but you need a bigger population sample to get those. And th those occur because of non allelic homologous recombination between between the two different um, two different lengths, rather it would be a products of kind of an unequal homologous combination type pattern, um, where you might have two copies with two, and then you recombine so you have one and three, right? Or you maybe you, you can imagine the different variations of that. Um, yeah, but they're they're in different haplotypes, and, and that's what the variation. Oh, so I have another question, but uh, so is there any functional uh, implications uh, that uh, why are those genes in these uh, loop regions? Why are the genes in the regions? I mean, or is, is there any functional implications? 
Implication, so implication here is interesting because the, there's a claim that this locus is associated with like schizophrenia risk, for example, or with immune system function. It makes sense that it's associated with immune system function and that it's an MHC. Um, presumably, if you have more or fewer copies, it might change some important, um, important phenotype. Uh, it's, I have to say, it's in this particular case, initially we thought, yeah, there's good evidence it's associated with schizophrenia, but then reviewing those papers, there's a lot of confusion. Um, but yeah, in, in effect, you have major change because you have a, a total change in dosage that's, that's, that's fixed in the, in the cell. And so it, you know, the, these are a place where you can have innovation without, um, without damage, right? Because you're just you're changing dosage and uh, maybe changing the diversity of the, of the expressed proteins. But so they're, they're very common in human genomes and maybe a few thousand loci that, that behave this way. Um, I think they, Evan Eichler actually has some very good line of research showing that they're important in even human specific lineage kind of innovations genomically. So I, I think they are, they are important. And the untangling pangenome part is very interesting. So can you comment on how this pangenome concept change people to change people study structural variation or SNPs? Yeah, so I guess the SNP side is interesting because in, in a world where every genome is just completely assembled, then the problem of detecting a SNPs, kind of, it goes away in some sense. Now, you more have a problem of understanding like the localization of SNPs, say inside of these variants, here I'm showing you that it's not clear like even what order they occur in and they're in my graph they're a loop it could be hard to say this snip occurs at that place so that now you have a new a new kind of problem um, in that sense but I think from the structural variant perspective this can be radically simplifying because instead of having some complicated picture of I found a variant here and here and here and here and here against the reference in this region I can tell you you know everyone is basically just different numbers of copies of some underlying sequence. Like any, anything you're seeing is mostly fitting into that. I think that's gonna make it much easier for people to approach and think about the structural variants. Because a big problem is just telling it's like the same variant, you know? That's, that's been an issue we've had. So are you, are you imagine like uh, in future, uh, whenever we do, we wanted to find out SNPs or structural variation, we do assembly first and then apply this pan genome idea? Is that? Yes, yeah, if you use one of these, these are basically multi-sample variant callers, like as Jen talked about, I used to work on variant calling from short reads, and unfortunately I haven't strayed far, because now I'm doing multi-sample variant calling with whole assemblies. Um, but as that is the focus that they, they basically have, all the methods in the pan-genome project, that's what they get to. They put, they put a bunch of genomes together and they help you understand the structural variants and you know, small variants as well inside them. Yeah, I think it would be helpful. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm not sure how much I got it, so if my question is stupid, I'm sorry already. <laughs> Just, I, I think I understood the point is to integrate more and more information, right? Not just one assembly, but many. And I was just curious first, how do you define how many? I think you took 88 assemblies. And how do you define what is useful and where is the limit? I don't know. I, so, okay. so I'll point out one thing. So we have in here in this process, I said, oh, we do an all to all alignment. That's, um, that's, that's expensive. It's quadratic. And so that suggests that there is some place where it becomes just really hard to do. And we have some, some tricks to get around that problem. You can make a, a tree across the sequences and do fewer alignments that way. Then you do logarithmic number of alignments. Um, or you can do a progressive approach, but then the, the progressive approach might take longer and longer. As you add thousands of genomes, you have to serially like incorporate each new one so it doesn't parallelize. Um, and then the additional information you're getting goes down and down because like every new, in, new sequence is more and more like the graph. There's less and less marginal benefit adding it. And so I do think that there's, there's kind of a, a real limit to the, the scalability of the, the methods. I mean, an aside actually is that you probably want to put in high quality sequences because putting in low quality ones will make difficulty for you. But um, there, there, are, there are ways, yeah, so if you wanted to follow up. Yeah, because I was thinking if in the future you think you can, instead of adding more and more assemblies, like integrate functional data, because if I understood well here, it's, each position is a different base pair. 
each right. position. Yeah. So. And can you like decorate those base pairs yeah, with features? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't get it. Oh, actually, the, the side I had was a good example. So, uh, yes. So here, these are actually records from a bed file that we've injected into the graph, and because the the ranges on any genome inside the graph correspond to a path, it just fits into the same model. Okay. Um, and yeah, in terms of individually annotating bases, the kind of same principle applies. You could imagine annotating the bits of the genomes, and you could also imagine annotating bits of the graph, and they, they, they sort of interplay with each other. I think it's, okay, it's thank un you. unexplored, but it hopefully provides a way forward. <coughs> thank so the, uh, the recombination was very intriguing. So do you think that the physical proximity of this chromosome led to more recombination and therefore more similarity and that in further increase <laughs> or they started out with the more similarity mm. and it's not like it'd be great to be able to even give a hypothesis for that. <laughs> I mean we could make a bunch of stories that one is like um one is kind of like, well, in the beginning, there was one RDNA cluster, uh, but that's not really true naturally. Yeah. Like, you don't, you know, and then it like, expanded. But I think that probably didn't happen. It's probably more something like physical proximity, shared function, makes it advantageous if things get homogenized. And so that sets up this state where you want a little bit of homogenization, a little bit of diversity, but it's okay if things recombine and it's actually per permitted easily by the cell because of the physical proximity. Yeah, so, but, so the kind of test that if you just go beyond human and if you have other things, do you begin yeah. to see that? Yes, this yeah, and the primates were seeing some fun stuff. Oh, okay, so yeah. you see this, there is a sort of common rule that is... It's, I, I, think, I think we need to dig into the full, we need to do the same thing, but with like all the, all the RDNA carrying chromosomes in primates and we see what kind of shape comes out of it and maybe we could make a, make a hypothesis uh, to, to point. Uh, yeah. Do you want a mic? Sorry. No, I thought you raised your hand. Yeah? No, go, go for it. Yeah. I'll repeat your question. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious about the I'm curious about the state data sets so you could compare between primates you know people have argued that copy number variation and variation between shrimp and humans are associated with a lot of disease loci so this looks like a great way of being able to compare mm -hmm. are those data sets still needing to emerge for the the primates no, and the right or where is that it's in the vertebrate genomes project there's actually a kind of primate focused group and um it's uh yeah, we have many complete assemblies. Uh, I didn't, I didn't show them here. Actually, we have a paper, a manuscript just out on the PGGB pipeline, and we, we in fact use a comparative genomics context with all the all the complete primate assemblies. Actually, those are the best ones in the vertebrate genomes project right now. They're the ones that are like telomere to telomere quality. Um, I think they're most of the immediate limited, lineage immediate to humans is is present there. So it, the data is coming, and you know you could use these various tools to, to try to get access to it. You could also just use regular alignment approaches and standard things we were doing. But the, yeah, the data is available, it's public. There's a website called um, Genome Arc that links to all this stuff. So, so it's out there. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Eric. Thank you all.